Hello, 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 hello. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. As you're coming in, feel free to turn your cameras on, say hello. Thank you so much for joining us again. Hello, hello, hello. I know some people are live streaming. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for being in the space. Thank you so much for being here. Hopefully some more people will be trickling in. This is our third week of our Afro Latine Super Friends Playwriting Hour. And we have an incredible playwright with us today, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to, um, before we start, I want to acknowledge, as I have in the um, past couple sessions that we have done, um, a land acknowledgement and where I am right now. And I want to recognize the history and the location and the relationship to the indigenous communities of Los Angeles, where we acknowledge the Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of a Um, and also the importance of the traditional ancestral and unceded land that we stand on. This is very important to me. And I recently took a workshop, as I had mentioned last week, where I learned that even the language that we're using, the Tongva and the Tovangar, or uh, the Gabrielino people, is language that is colonized and the record of languages of who the people and how folks self-identified isn't necessarily there and the importance of acknowledging that as well, that even as we do a land acknowledgement, that even some of the language within the land acknowledgement is sometimes a line of the colonizer. I also want to acknowledge that folks are still striking and um, the Writers Guild is standing strong and they are asking folks to please come and join them uh, while they pick it um, in multiple different cities. So if you live in LA, you live in New York or any other cities where folks are striking and they're at the picket lines, please come in and join folks because it's very, very important. Um, for those of you who are writers and are in the space and taking a moment to, um, to celebrate your own writing and not the, uh, the writer strike, and that's okay if you're celebrating your own writing for yourself, and especially if you're a playwright. Um, but again, really important to acknowledge the importance of writers and what they provide for us. With that said, I also want to introduce the folks in our space. Um, today we have two ASL interpreters. We have Gregorio and we have Tania. So they will both be jumping in and out and being our um, ASL interpreters for the session. I also want to acknowledge Miranda, who's doing our live captioning, and Thea for being able to manage everything behind the scenes. And with that, I am going to turn over, oh yes, I'm seeing some people I hadn't seen last week, I'm so excited. I'm turning it over to Rachel and I will place Rachel's incredible bio in, um, in our chat for everyone to see. But just recently, just to show, show, share some joy, Rachel, you've been commissioned by Yale and all, I mean, just that's such amazing, incredible. So I'm just so excited along with Guadalisa. We have two Afro-Latina playwrights who have been commissioned, um, which is like a first and so exciting. So with that joy, I pass it on to you and I will place your bio in the chat. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, all right, so I'm gonna jump right in. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint. I know that in the world of uh, Zoom, whether you think we're post-pandemic or mid-pandemic, it's annoying to look at PowerPoints, but I'm a reader and I like to be able to have things to see. So I hope that that's okay. Um, I'm going to do that now. This was so much smoother earlier. It always does this, doesn't it? Okay, there we go. Every <laughs> time, every time. And right, I'm going to also move you out. Okay, great. So today we're going to talk about joy, not trauma. This is a workshop that I've been developing for a couple of years. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to get into it with all of you. And we're gonna go over a couple of things. So first, disagreements and acknowledgements. I wanted to set up expectations. There is a mini lecture that's in here. Um, we're gonna go back pretty deep into basics that you all know, and then kind of curve around it. There will be timed writing exercises. So please, if you can, if you have a pencil and paper, a computer, I will keep track of time for you. And then in the end, we'll end with a Q&A. Um, and I'm going to hope to give you enough time for Q&A to where it's not so much time the world is staring at each other, but enough time where you can ask me anything you want. You can ask me about the workshop. You can ask me about Yale. You can ask me about the strike. I'm one of the uh, WGA writers right now striking. Anything you want to ask me, you can ask me. Um, I do ask that you stay muted until the end and to save your questions until the end or during the writing exercises via the chat. 
Um, we're humans. I so will turn my camera off. I will turn my camera on. You can do whatever you want to do with your camera. Please feel free to do that. I do have cats that will show up randomly in the Zoom. I live at home. These are my cats and I love them. So if they grace you with, your pres with their presence, you're welcome. Um, I also want to quickly acknowledge a bias. I am speaking from my perspective, from my ex learned experience. We all have our own learned experiences. If there's something that happens in here where you're like, Rachel, I disagree with that. I do not believe that there's such thing as a single right answer. There are many right answers. So if there's something where you're like, nah, that doesn't, that doesn't ring true. Let's talk about it. I want to talk about it at the end. I think defensiveness gets in the way of progress. I just want to know. I want to talk. I want to have a conversation. Um, I am not a perfect person and I am a very busy person. I usually make these PowerPoints at 2 a.m. So there's probably a typo in here. Just going to be honest, there might be a typo. I'm sorry in advance. That's like a big deal to some people. I have a long rant about why I don't think it should be, but we do not have the time for that. Um, I also just want to say that this is the beginning of a conversation. It is not the complete discourse. It's an hour, and I hope that we can be in community together. Um, the final thing that I like to do is something I really like to do to start off, and I will pull out a timer, is just take a minute to just do whatever breathing exercise you like to do. If you want to take a couple deep breaths, whatever you can to kind of place you in the moment and place you here so that you can be here and hear and absorb as much as you can. Uh, I don't like to lead guided meditations because what works for some people doesn't work for other people. So I'm going to start my timer now. Um, please take this minute to do whatever. You can turn your camera off. I will probably turn my camera off and turn it back on. Uh, do whatever breathing exercises you like to do, and I'll pop back on when the minute's over. Okay, thank you. I hope that minute was rewarding and helpful and helping you ground yourself a little. Okay, next. So whenever I, I actually used to have this slide deeper in the uh, PowerPoint and like I've had to push it forward because I've had so many people be like, try it again. And so I want to just start off with it. I want to front load it. Um, I've been asked a lot, Rachel, what's your beef with trauma? Like trauma is important. Trauma is how we tell stories. Trauma is conflict, blah, 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 which we'll, we're gonna talk about all of that. But I wanna start off just by saying there's a difference between trauma and trauma-informed storytelling. And what I'm talking about when I say joy versus trauma is trauma-informed storytelling. It's just for anyone who's ever done a workshop before, the shorter the title, the easier it is to get people to spell it correctly. So, and to get all the words in there. So it's really joy, not, trauma-informed storytelling. We all have, being a person of color in the United States means living in existence of some sort of trauma. I'm not asking you to turn a part of yourself off. I'm not asking you to not acknowledge that. And I will talk about how trauma does work in storytelling. Trauma-informed storytelling is what I have a problem with and what I'm gonna be actively talking about today. So you're probably like, well, what that, what is trauma-informed storytelling? Um, so trauma-informed storytelling is where the point of the story is to traumatize the audience or to incite a trauma. So it's not trauma. So when we talk about trauma, which that's a whole other definition that I don't have time to get into. So I'm going to be a really base thing. We talk about, let's say bad thing happened, which again, this is not trauma. I'm being very simplistic. Bad thing happened. If I write a play and bad thing happens and the play, the action of the play is about the characters trying to work together as a community to fight against that bad thing and to grow, that's not trauma-informed storytelling, but it still has a trauma in it. Trauma-informed storytelling is we see the bad thing happen over and over and over and over again. And as an audience, you're kind of left with like a whiplash feeling of 
you feel like you're carrying someone else's weight. So that's trauma-informed storytelling. I see this a lot. Um, I'm gonna, there's like the theater of cruelty practices that we see. I'm gonna try not to theater nerd out too much, but essentially trauma-informed storytelling is where the point of the story is to traumatize the audience. Where the point of the story, the flow of the story, it, the resolution of the story ends in trauma, or it's throughout the thing we see acts of trauma in a way that some people say wake up the audience and I think personally traumatizes the audience. So the difference between conflict and trauma, we're gonna talk about it later, um, but I just wanted to jump in and say that. I also wanna say, I'm not saying we shouldn't have tragedies anymore. We shouldn't have dramas <laughs> anymore. I'm just saying that we should find a way to talk about our traumas without it having to be the main event and that we can talk more about collective storytelling and not only rooting in trauma. I've seen a lot of like, I have slowly come to accept that I like horror movies. I, for a very long time, like to say I didn't and I now have to accept that I do. And I think that like, there are some horror movies that you watch and you're just like any Ari Aster film where you're just traumatized the entire time, right? Like Midsommar versus like something like Bodies, 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 which like traumatic things happen in that, but the point is not to traumatize the audience at all. And so those are kind of like my two references of framework here of what I'm saying when I say you can't have conflict without it being traumatic. I also don't think that trauma-informed storytelling is inclusive, but we will talk about that later. I think it's actually incredibly exclusive. So just front-loading with this. Again, this used to be deeper in, but this became the main event. So <laughs> this is where we're gonna roll back a little bit. So I know that when I was first coming to playwriting, I was told the gold standard was this setup, right? There's stasis, something happens. And then rising action happens, boom, climax, falling action, resolution. And then that's that's storytelling. That's always that's the perfect way to tell a story, right? No, I hate it. I hate it so <laughs> much. I've always hated it. I will continue to hate it. Um, my problem with stasis, my biggest problem is it assumes there's such thing as stasis in your life. I do not think any person of color in the United States has stasis in their lives. We do not know waking up at the beginning of the day what is gonna happen at the end of the day, even if we have our day scheduled out. I don't think anybody does, quite frankly, but I definitely, especially not people of color, you cannot plan something horrible happening to you that is completely out of your control because of your lack of privilege in the United States. So to have a calm before the storm is nonsense. It's like, it's rather you're picking which explosion to lean towards rather than a singular explosion that sets off the story. So that's my biggest problem with stasis. I also think stasis assumes for there to be stasis, you have to be part of the status quo. And if you're not part of that status quo, you're automatically excluded from that. Rising and falling actions. The example that I like to give is the way that we tell the story of like the American Revolution, right? Basically, I'm gonna be really simplistic again, but basically a bunch of folks were mad at the king and they got on some boats and they came here and then they threw some tea in the ocean and they went, enough! And they started a war and they fought for our rights and our freedoms. That's not what happened at all. That's just what we were told. It's very linear. We like to tell the history in a very linear way. Or like, I like to think about the way we talk about like the Civil Rights Act, right? It was like, first there was slavery and then there was segregation. And then we had the Civil Rights Act and we all, we fixed it, we did it. And we keep like to build on things, but that's not, that's not how history works. That's not how storytelling actually works. And so to force a story in that, I think does a great disservice to it because you're leaving out so many of the complicated ebbs and flows that I think actually in itself creates more conflict. So crisis is a swarm, it's not a line. And I think that's something that's really important to me in my storytelling. My problem with resolution, and like I've gotten in lots of fights with theater historians about this. And so this is a thing where my email address is gonna be available at the end of this PowerPoint. We can talk about it because I have been told that I do not understand this correctly and I disagree. Um, so, but again, I'm open to disagreements. It assumes that there is an end, not a literal end, but a solution. Like I have this problem. I slept with my mom and now I'm gonna gouge my eyes out, right? Like I did not, that's a story, that's a real story. <laughs> Like it assumes that there's like some sort of like end to things and at least a solution or just denouement or whatever, but I hate that word. So um, I don't agree with that. I don't think that that's what existence looks like. I don't think what, that's what our lives look like. And so my life's just not that neat. And I don't think anybody's lives are that neat. So I wanna talk about a different kind of storytelling. So this is the way that I write most of my plays. Before I get into it, I don't think everyone has to write plays this way. 
I don't not that think that these are the only places that should that exist, but I think we have so too many I want to talk about a different kind of not enough list. So this is the way that I, I write most of my novels. plays. Before I get so into it, one of the biggest things everyone has to write um, plays this way. I studied black I don't history in think the that these are the only plays that should exist, but I think we have too many of the other kinds that not enough of this where they're character driven more balanced. And it's joy and community focused. One of the biggest things is on the collective I studied black history in the 1970s and we think about it a lot like the protagonist like who's the main character think about how many times their character Director, and it's joy and story focused and the emphasis hate is that question. I hate it so much. It like burns my storytelling. Story it's like it's our story. We think about it a lot. Like um, the they don't like that answer. Like right who's the main character? Let's so how many times an artist director. But what if instead of trying to tell a storytelling story, we told it from the hate that question. I hate it so much. It like burns my soul. We're not like it's our story. Um, they don't like that story. answer, by the way. They how does that change so, the way in which we're telling stories? But what if instead of trying to tell a storytelling on the show, suffering and pain and trauma, experience of if instead of focusing on of people, one bad thing happening to one bad story, person, and we're instead this is happening to a community How does that change the way in which we're telling these stories? And we then become the collective the way we show suffering and pain and trauma? If instead of focusing on one bad thing happening to one bad person, and instead this is happening I do think more plays need to be written this way. And how do we make it collective? And we so, then become the Let's get to it. I promise you, you'd be writing. We're going to jump in and we're going to write. Um, again, again I will play keep track of this time. I think don't worry about that. that. I do think and more plays. Please take as much of the time as you can. And if you're not ready to come so, back, there's no Let's get to it. I promise you, you'd be writing. We're going to jump in and we're going to write. adventure type. Again, I will keep track of time. So don't worry about that. Right off the bat, I want you to focus on the now. Please take as much of the time as you can. What are three things that bring you joy right now in your life? And how important is that joy to you? What would you do to so, keep it? Right off the bat, what would you I do want to you to focus it? on the now. I'm going to give you four minutes. This. What are three things and that bring you joy time. right now in your life? And how important is that joy to you? What would you do to keep it? What did you do to get it? And you will not have to share this. And timer starts now.
Okay, we're gonna keep writing. Next, I want you to think of three sacrifices. I want you to think of a time that something brought you great joy in the end, but you had to sacrifice something for it to get it. Okay. You had to lose you something. Keep writing. Um, an example that I like to give. Next, uh, this is my silly example you of because you're not sure. Please be way more serious I want you to think of a time this. that something brought so, you great joy. Um, I was married in the end, it, you had to sacrifice something for it to we, get it. My you had to lose something. Um, husband and I. I'm um, an example that I like to give. My birthday. Uh, this is my together. silly it was example. Really big because you're not sharing this. Spend a birthday together. But then my best friend was like, "Hey, do you want to go to Disney World for your thirtieth?" And I was like. Husband and I, I we would I always spend heck yeah, my birthday I want to go to really Disney big deal World for my 30th. Together. But then but that my best would friend mean not was like, hey, do you um, want to go to Disney World my birthday for my birthday 30th? And I was husband. like, and I so heck yeah, I want to go to Disney World for my 30th. And but that would mean not spending. But that is one of the best My birthday with my birthday. It brought me so much great joy. And so I made the right choice. I've joked that's for me that was a big divorce, sacrifice. That's it was something, something I had to give up. That was actually really um, important to me. So I, I want you to think of something three us, times, but that, that is one of the best had to sacrifice. Like it brought me so much great joy. In order for I think this I made joy the right that you got to have, I've joked that's why we got divorced. But that's again, not, that's not the real. This was a silly example. So I want you to think of something three times that you had to sacrifice something in order for this joy that you got to have, but it meant something. It cost you something. And again, this was a silly example. Please, since you don't have to share these, think a little bit deeper. Okay, one more. 
Um, three communities. So I've got a cat screaming, so I'm sorry if you hear him. Um, so three communities uh, that you belong to. So before I get into it, I want to say that playwriting is world building. No matter what kind of play you're writing, you're world building. A coffee shop in Brooklyn is not the same thing as a coffee shop in LA. And it really bothers me that people say world building like it's this very specific like fantasy world. Anytime you write a story, you're world building. It does not matter if you go, if you and I both go sit in the same Starbucks, we will not write the same play, even if we're writing with the same characters, the same people, the same circumstance. Everything we do is world building. And so part of that is building the communities that exist in those worlds. So that rant aside, I want you to think about three communities that you belong to and what you feel like you owe these communities and what you don't owe these communities. Um, again, I'll time you, but something that I really want to say is that you can be as specific as you want, or you can be as general as you want. So like, I like to say that I'm Afro-Latina, but I'm also an ex-athlete. Um, I'm also left-handed and I'm very strongly attached to my left-handed community. I love being left-handed. Um, I'm a cat person and I love other cat people. Uh, I'm an animal person really, but that's for later for the Q&A. Um, so yeah, three communities that you belong to. What do you owe to them and what do you not owe to them? Okay, great. great. So, <laughs> so I, think I think that, that we, we all decide, decide what we owe and don't owe our communities. So, so I like to talk about this again. This is my personal, personal belief. belief. But, but I believe, I believe that anytime we're writing a story or anything, anything it is our responsibility to represent our community in a way that, that both challenges and uplifts them. them. It's, it's not, not about praise, praise but it's also not about showing open cuts either. What I mean by this is the reality of the way that my shows are performed right now is the majority of those audiences are white. They are, they are not, not their cis, cis straight, straight white, white people. people. I'm, I'm none, none of those things. things. I'm a, a non-binary, non queer, queer, queer African person. person. Like, like that's, that's not me. me. And, and so, so I'm, I'm going to talk about my community, which is what I want to do. I want to create more spaces. The reason why I got into the writing in the first place 
was because, because I, was I was told that there, there were no queer black, black writers. writers. When, when I was an undergrad, undergrad and I was like, absolutely, absolutely not. No, 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 no,
that you already have. This exercise doesn't work as well when you already when they already exist. But again, you're free adults to do what you choose to do. Um, you're going to create two brand new characters. Um, you, you're going to come up with their names. What do they like? What do they dislike? What makes them happy? What makes them sad? Uh, a joke that I like to say is like, if this was a dating profile, what's on their dating profile? What's not on their dating profile? What do they leave it off? And then also do the three joys, three sacrifices, and three communities exercise that you did for yourself for each of your characters. What are these characters willing to do for joy? What are they willing to risk for their joy? Um, it's supposed to be two. I did not mention that in the slide, but I do want to say it is two characters that you are creating. Not If you have time to create more than two, have at it. Live your wildest life. But two characters, preferably, uh, for this exercise. I'll start timing you now.
Okay. Um, keep writing. I just bring a sparkle of time. I want to jump to the next thing while you're doing it. In a single sentence from each of your characters' point of view, I want you to write, I want, this is their need that they need more than anything in the world, and I'm willing to sacrifice what for it. And it needs to be beyond willing to die for it. I think that that's kind of like we, as people who are mortal, death is an end, right? It is the biggest thing. Unfortunately for characters, death is kind of an out. And so it needs to be a little bit more something that they have to live with the consequences of. So unfortunately in storytelling, if you die, you don't have to live with the consequences because you, unless you bring them back, which is a plot twist, you can definitely do that. But for the most part, think a little bit beyond willing to die for it for that sacrifice. Um, and I'm gonna keep timing you. Also, for the sake of time, I'm going to do three minutes and not five. Okay, we're not going to do this part um, because I want to make sure that we have time for the Q&A, but I do want you to know about it. So now you have your characters. What's the story here? If these two characters are trapped in a room together, what would they talk about? What would they disagree about? What would they agree about? Um, I want you later when you do this exercise, hopefully, because uh, again, I want to have enough time for the Q&A because uh, I really think that's important. I swear this workshop is usually like 30 minutes. I don't know why it's so much longer this time. I'm rambling, I guess. Um, take some time to write five to seven sentences of what the play could be, but stop at the most heightened moment. This is your climax of your story. So when you do this exercise, don't end the story. Stop at the climax. Here's why. I've been told that I start my plays at end of play. So with your sentences, when you do this later, um, instead of starting with how you started before, start at the climax. Make that the beginning of the story. How does that change the structure of the way that you tell the story? What if 
all of that, everything that happened before your climax, that was their conversations, they're getting into it, it was all just still exposition. And you're just starting the story at the most heightened moment. I love writing plays this way. I love in apologies, the war has already happened. They're just chilling on their backyard, right? Like they're, they've already dealt with the trauma and the tension. In Black Mexican, one of my characters who is kind of being abused by her professor, a lot of that abuse we don't see in the play. We just hear about it after. We hear about it when one a different student is like, ah, something in the chicken grease don't smell right, right there. Um, and so starting a play much later, starting a play, starting the play from the climax and seeing how you go from there, when you start from the most heightened place, I think immediately changes my problem with stasis and rising action is that you're starting from a place of chaos and not stasis and then finding your way to the joy, which is, I think, a really important way of telling the story. So we're gonna do that. Um, a couple more things that I wanna share before we get into the Q&A. Um, this is bad advice that I've gotten throughout my years as a playwright that sounded like really good advice. And I'm gonna explain all of them. My first one is be a good egg. I don't like this advice. Um, I think that yes, we shouldn't be jerks. We should be nice people. But too many times have people tried to cross my boundaries and then pushed it with, come on, be a good egg. Come on, do the right thing. Do what this artistic director is telling you to do even though it damages your play. And so I really wish that someone had said to me the power of no, instead of be a good egg. Learn that no is a complete sentence. Know that you can say, no, I'm not comfortable with that and know your worth that you can walk away. I like to tell the story that I got commissioned to write a play and I had taken the money and then they suddenly changed the deals of the contract. And I was like, nope, absolutely not. I gave them the money back. I was like, I'm not doing that. And they're like, you'll be lucky if you'll find somebody else to do this play. I've tri I tripled the money that I was gonna make from them with this play. Know your worth and know that you can say no if something does not feel right. Um, the next thing is the best plays happen around special events. That can happen, that's true. But as I've talked about, you don't need a wedding, a funeral, or a graduation. A play can start at dinner, right? Think about how many Pulitzer winning plays are just a dinner. They don't always have to be the same events. Um, playwrights shouldn't speak when getting feedback. I think that you should hear and have an open ear and be willing to discuss and talk about things with people. But I think the silencing, especially of playwrights of color that happens in MFA programs is dangerous. And we need to really start to think about who we're getting this feedback from, whether or not they're part of our communities. And we should absolutely be able to speak back and say, yeah, no, I don't think you got it. And that's not you being defensive. That's you standing up for not just you, but also the way your community is represented. Um, everything needs to make sense by the end of the play. Nonsense. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Tell a lie. Jose Rivera says he'd like tell one lie in every single play. I like to say, have something unexplainable. Have something that when someone says, I don't like, this doesn't make sense. Oh, that's fine. That's okay. I think give people something to work through, something to chew on when they leave. And if everything makes sense, what are they chewing on? What are they talking about at the bar? Um, I kind of hinted at this earlier, where I said that you should like that I hate when artistic directors ask you, what is the audience supposed to walk away with? What are you making the audience feel? I hate this mentality. Um, because you are not there, I don't think personally, to manipulate an audience in that way. I think theater should be a conversation. I don't think theater should be a lecture. I think that we need to remember that our audience are part of the performance and what they walk away with is what they choose to walk away with. And if they walk away with something radically different than what you intended, that is not your fault as the artist. Your job is to present something, not to dictate. And that is something that's really, really important. And so when people start asking me that, I've stopped saying, I don't know what they're gonna walk away with. I don't, that's not on me. It's not on me to decide what they're gonna walk away with. It's not on me to decide what their takeaway is. I know what the story I'm trying to tell and what someone takes away from that is beyond me. That is outside of my reach. Okay, so because I really wanted to leave time for questions, I'm gonna stop share. Um, please, if you wanna turn your cameras back on, please come back uh, in these next 10 minutes. This is a time to ask me absolutely anything you wanna ask me. If I said something where you're like, you're out of pocket, Tell me I'm out of pocket. Um, <laughs> I, welcome. <laughs> I first want to start by saying thank you. Um, I love this notion of like resistance, right? Like that 
our work and I just I was like yes 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 being in the space the writing it brought me so much joy and I was like yes I just wanted to open up with that and I'd love to hear from folks in the space thank you hi I think I thank you so much this was an amazing workshop um and I think I just had like a curiosity question of like did you find yourself writing a different type of play that made you get to this exploration of like not using you know of like finding your this model of of joy rather than trauma and horror plays and like if that happened from an experience or if you had you you know like more just anecdotally like how did the root of like okay i'm going to shift my focus into this um emphasized type of playwriting occur because I think it's very interesting, like, was it a specific experience or just like, you know, from you watching too many of those types of plays and being like, I'm done, or I don't know, whatever you else could, you could. Offer. I think she left. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she said that uh, my Zoom cut out trying to jump on now. All right, right in the most important. <laughs> They will be joining. She's rejoining now. Yes. Okay, good. Yay! <laughs> you are muted, so make sure you unmute. Rachel, you are muted, so make sure that we can have you. Okay, can there you hear me go. now? Yes. Okay, I'm so sorry. My computer just started making a crazy sound. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and then we were like, yes! And all of a sudden, <laughs> it's okay. You're back. Yes. Hi. So what inspired you um, to write these stories, I think, is basically one of the, you know, what was what made you turn to this focus? Um, I got really tired of, so the very specific thing that happened was I kind of had a breakdown where I had to play, I was in Streetcar Named Desire, and I just saw that the way that it, like, and we tried to do it like a color conscious way, which I have strong feelings about. Um, and it just, I watched how it weighed on all of the actors every single night. And I just remember thinking, I don't want to write stories like this. Like, and I'm not saying that it's not a great play, but that's just not the kind of stories I, I like, I was an actor. I love actors. And I think a lot about what is the baggage they have to carry when they go home after doing these roles. And I don't want my, act I want my actors to feel uplifted and celebrated. And, um, so that's kind of what inspired me and kind of how I started on this. And the need of that, especially right, mom, um, it's always needed, but I think right now even more so. Mm -hmm. Angel's asking a question in the chat. Could you talk more about the soul aesthetic fragmented musicals? Sure. Um, it didn't do super well. I, oh God, I don't have enough time. Um, the shortest thing about it is the soul aesthetic and fragmented musicals was they were, it, it's kind of like, um, Hair is unfortunately a really good example of some a musical that steals that aesthetic where the whole point wasn't a plot. The fragmented musicals are all about just to show different members of a community and different things like, uh, mm -hmm. like the idea of like plays that were all monologues. We have thanks to the fragmented musicals from the soul era. Um, and the idea was to highlight the specific characters, but there was no plot. There wasn't um, conflict in the way that we traditionally see it. Uh, please email me um, and to talk to more about that. I just, I want to be conscious of time. So, but the idea was to show people, not story, is a really simplistic way of talking about it while also involving music and community and community-driven storytelling. Ooh, I just learned something new. <laughs> Angel, thank you so much for asking that question. <laughs> yes, Krista, please. Hi, <laughs> thank you so much, Rachel and Daphne. Um, I'm curious, uh, who are you reading, either playwright or novelist or nonfiction writer, that you feel um, embodies this um, uh, methodology of storytelling? Yeah, um, I've read your plays, I love them. Um, I... <laughs> Let's see. I mean, I'm reading a lot of my contemporaries, I think. Adrian Dawes, who I think is doing next week or two weeks. Um, uh, I think they might be our last session. Okay. I think uh, yeah. oh, Stacey Rose. Um, God, my brain's always blanking whenever I ask this. Uh, I think what's really important to me is reading people that are writing right now. 
uh, I really, really love the work of Jose Rivera. I've mentioned him. Um, reading about, I haven't been, I'll be super honest, like I needed to take a little bit of a break from theater. Uh, so the last six months I haven't been reading plays and I'm excited to get back into them. A book that I read that I think embraces this idea, it takes its time, is called If I Survive You by Jonathan Escoffrey. And like, um, highly recommend it, highly, highly recommend it. It's a character really struggling to find joy. And the ending I think is really poignant. Um, and I'm happy to provide a list of playwrights after I've got so many on my blog, but uh, my brain is fully blanking because I'm paranoid about my computer. I'm sorry. <laughs> How do we find your blog so that anyone who's looking to we make sure that we can go straight to it? We'll we'll put it in the chat for you. But is it um, under your name? Is it? Oh, that's a good question. It's really hard to find now because I made it hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> I actually really I've learned a lot in your blog. You've had some amazing posts that you put in about playwriting and play selections and things of the sort. So we yeah. will have to go on a search. <laughs> I think that you. <laughs> Do it. So my blog is called But Am I Famous Yet? And if you Google But Am I Famous Yet blog, Rachel Lynette, it'll pop up. It's not on my website anymore. Um, and I am happy if anyone wants to talk to me in my email about that, why I took it off my website. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure if you Google But Am I Famous Yet, Rachel Lynette blog, it should pop up. Mm. Thank you. There we go. Boom. <laughs> we have time possibly for one more question. Does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask? So not so much a, a question, but definitely a comment on, you know, uh, about the trauma informed storytelling. I did write one of my first pieces. It was, um, I guess, uh, a story about my father and I, but very exaggerated, very like stretched out just for the purpose of telling our story but then I noticed that it was just trauma it was just trauma 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 so then by my second rewrite I just I wanted to keep the trauma because it was very important to tell the conflict story but I needed to find the moments of joy I needed to find the moments of love and really bring that out from this family in order for the trauma to not be so traumatic for the audience um, I always felt like as an audience member, you want to kind of feel some kind of catharsis, some kind of joy, some kind of resolution. Um, and then I recently had a conversation with a friend of mine who wrote a play. And when I read his play, I was like, I hate the character. I hate them. Like, I want to beat <laughs> them up. And he goes, good, I did my job. And I was like, but where's the resolution? All I saw was trauma on the side of the ab of the abused and all i saw was the abuser get his way and i was just so angry he goes get yeah, good i want that i wanted that for my audience so it's just very different for me to want a resolution and having a playwright say no i want you to feel angry i want you mm -hmm. to have that frustration thank you oh mm -hmm. thank you all right we are um, almost completely out of time. So again, thank you everyone so much for being in the space. Next week, Josefina Baez is going to be joining us. They are an incredible performing artist and playwright, Afro-Latine, incredible human being. Um, let's please give Rachel a big round of applause, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And also a big thank you to our ASL interpreters and Miranda um, for doing her live captioning. Thank you everyone so much. And hopefully y'all can join us next week and come on and spend some time loving yourself and writing. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>